Swift. Hello. Thank you for having me. These things are always a fun, always fun for me to do. Uh, I love the summit timeframes when we're talking about summaries of what's going on because it gets a chance to see exactly what's uh, reflect on what's uh, happened and how we can go forward from here. So my name is John Dickinson. Uh, I am not my name on IRC and Twitter, and I am the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift. Swift, which is the object storage component of OpenStack. The background image that I chose here is one of the international prototypes for the kilogram. And the, the principal one is stored near Paris. And so since the summit was there, that's what we named the next integrated release in OpenStack. Uh, we, we called it the kilo release uh, after, after that uh, international standard that is stored near Paris. So I think that was a kind of a, a cool choice, and I, I really liked that. And I, and I think it actually reflects a little bit of what's going on inside of uh, the community overall, and something that I have seen inside of Swift as well. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But as a high-level summary, Swift is an object storage engine. It is built for scale. It's optimized for durability, availability, and concurrency across the entire data set. Uh, it is. Uh, my vision for Swift is that everyone will use it every day, even if they don't realize it. Uh, we see this uh, in uh, in a lot of places. It's uh, Swift is perfect for unstructured data that can grow without bounds. Uh, things like uh, uh, content generated and consumed by web and mobile apps, backups, documents, videos, pictures, that kind of stuff. I want to see people uh, using Swift when they're helping their kids with their homework by looking stuff up online. I want to see people using Swift when they're filing expense reports, when they're checking their bank balance, when they're watching videos uh, online. All of that kind of stuff are places that are great for Swift and in fact where Swift is being used today. So my overview is a summary of what's going on in the community. It's not dates or schedules. It's more of a reflection of conversations that are happening. And so that's, that's kind of what I want to share with you. So uh, looking at who's going on in the community, uh, first just kind of an update of the community side of things before we get into the technical piece. Uh, who's participating in the community I think is always an interesting question. And so we still have the, the, the most prolific and active uh, daily contributors into Swift these days are uh, are familiar names in the community. Uh, SwiftStack, Red Hat, HP, Rackspace, Intel, uh, all, uh, all of whom are contributing into uh, keeping Swift healthy and uh, pushing it into new directions. And it's a really solid base of contributors, and I'm proud to work with them. They, all of them are uh, really solid, uh, strong uh, contributors uh, technically and uh, strategically, and it's it's just a, it's a pleasure to work with these companies and to see uh, both what they're doing uh, in the marketplace, but also how they're, um, how they're bringing their varied expertise and uh, experience of different use cases into the uh, development community itself. And so that's been really excited, uh, exciting uh, for me to, uh, to see uh, continue in, uh, in this uh, recently and then going forward in the community. So what's next? What, else, what are we seeing? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think something that's really kind of cool is that we're seeing a lot more uptick, and things that I'm hearing are a lot uh, more of Swift being used and supported by third-party ecosystem apps. These, uh, I, I, work for, uh, I work for Swift Stack, and I have inter interactions uh, with people in the ecosystem quite a bit. And the thing that I am hearing uh, unprompted from people is that there's basically two object storage APIs that matter today, uh, S3 and Swift. And that is something that's really tremendously exciting. And, and I was talking about that the kilogram is a, is a standard that people adhere to. And I think what we're seeing also is the OpenStack APIs as a standard beyond what we like to tell ourselves internally in the community, but actually hearing feedback from people who are not involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, minutia of OpenStack itself, but actually just looking at this from a, a very broad ecosystem perspective. We're seeing OpenStack APIs uh, become supported as uh, first-class citizens. And so one of the things um, 
a few things that I guess are very interesting I've seen recently is looking at major applications like Commvault and Veeam uh, that are used in very large enterprises today, um, supporting Swift as a first-class citizen. Uh, Storage Made Easy is uh, one that has been adding a lot of great support recently. Uh, Gladinet, in fact, I just saw this morning, uh, announced uh, a, a tighter partnership with Helion Swift. Uh, and that's in addition to kind of some of the old favorites uh, that have been in the ecosystem for a while, like CyberDuck and Expand Drive. And of course, there's a ton of people using uh, Swift internally uh, for internal apps. They're writing their apps to talk directly to Swift. And so this is really kind of cool because what we're seeing is that Swift is becoming the thing that people are talking to for object storage. And this is because we're, well, I guess, because and as a result of this both, we're seeing more, more and larger clusters of Swift in the overall uh, installed base. Uh, this drives uh, demand for some of those more traditional enterprise features. Uh, and it, of course, uh, means that people need things like more automation. And I'll touch on some of these kind of things that we're talking about in a little bit. And so in addition to that, in addition to these uh, third-party client apps, but I think part of the same story is that we're also seeing in the, e in the community uh, more integration and interest from other storage providers, uh, both with a native integration using Swift's extensibility points to integrate natively, uh, but also uh, their own support of the Swift API. And so all of that is very interesting, looking at both who's contributing into the community, but then also the very large ecosystem about people who are uh, building applications and products and, and businesses around Swift itself and based on Swift as a standard object storage uh, API and implementation that can store uh, the data that people are using for applications today. And so that actually leads me to an interesting uh, new development that we've got in the community right now. How do clients interact with Swift? So we have been talking about uh, how to make things better for applications that are using Swift. And a lot of times the very first interaction that people have with Swift is using the official command line interface, the CLI, or the official Python uh, uh, development toolkit called the SDK. And so these things are part of the code base that we maintain as, as a Swift project inside of OpenStack. And so we've decided to make some changes in uh, some of our direction of what we're going forward here. Uh, they're kind of a, a long-term uh, effort. Uh, first off, the CLI is something that we are going to continue to keep and maintain and add features to and fix bugs in and add additional polish to and all of that. Uh, it's something that is a very useful tool for a lot of people to be able to uh, interact very easily from a command line uh, with a Swift, a Swift storage endpoint. The CLI uses the SDK. That is the Python wrapper to the OpenStack API, uh, a Swift API. The API itself is simply using HTTP, so standard uh, HTTP verbs and response codes. But we've got a higher level uh, wrapper around that written in, in, in Python that allows people to um, uh, interact with it programmatically a little more easily. And uh, the command line interface makes use of those tools. Now, the, there, is, there has been an effort inside of the OpenStack community to create a single OpenStack SDK project to give all of the OpenStack projects a more unified SDK and then uh, a single place where people can, uh, a single library that people can consume can then talk to all of the OpenStack projects. It's very early, especially for their implementation uh, and their support of Swift right now. But it's rather a uh, fortuitous time for, for us to uh, very closely work together, so the, the Swift community and the OpenStack SDK uh, team. And so what we're looking at and what we're talking about right now is taking uh, any efforts for future features and uh, in a new directions and, and rewrites and things like that of the uh, Python Swift Client SDK, and instead of focusing it there, we will um, 
focus on the new work that's being done inside of OpenStack SDK. What this allows us to do is make things a little more efficient uh, and uh, take the knowledge that we've developed over the last four or five years of writing Python and OpenStack, uh, the Python Swift client SDK, and uh, taking those lessons and doing it right, or doing it at least better uh, this time, so that we can focus on things a little bit uh, more like efficiency and, and performance and, and stuff like that. So since these guys are uh, essentially starting from scratch, and we, wanted, we realized that to do all of these major changes, we'd essentially have to start from scratch, we figured out uh, that it would be a really good opportunity to work closely together to, uh, to share, the, share the workload, but also uh, make something that's pretty cool. So this is a long-term uh, ongoing effort. Uh, it is something that uh, is, again, uh, it's not a particular schedule or timeline or something like that, but it's more of a, a general conversation we're having inside of the community. Um, we, of course, are going to be uh, very focused on uh, maintaining compatibility and making sure that existing applications that uh, do not break, and we're not abandoning Python, open stat, uh, Python Swift Client right now at all. So we will continue to improve that. We'll continue to uh, make sure that bugs are fixed, uh, especially on the CLI side. But on the SDK side, we're going to uh, look at uh, putting some more effort behind the OpenStack SDK project. So that's a change there um, that, that we're working on. And that's going to affect uh, some, some things going forward um, as far as how clients interact with that. So what else is next? Uh, there's, uh, Allison, next slide, please. Um, there's another. Uh, open source heavy group uh, called the GNOME Foundation, and they have an outreach program, which is kind of an, it's, it's an internship program, and it's something that is designed to get underrepresented groups involved in open source. So it's a really uh, it's a really great goal, and uh, something that I'm really happy to say that OpenStack has been a part of in the past and has continued to uh, invest uh, time and effort into. Uh, for the current round of the outreach, GNOME Outreach Program, OpenStack has six interns uh, participating across the, the various OpenStack projects. And one of those interns is working on Swift and is focusing on uh, improving some operational tools. And it's something that is really just a, I'm really happy that it's happening. And uh, um, our, our intern for inside of Swift is jumped in and has uh, already made some contributions into Swift, and uh, will continue to uh, add in some uh, tools uh, specifically designed to uh, do some uh, operational checking to validate uh, OpenStack deployment or Swift deployments just to make sure that um, everything is working well. So. That being said, as far as where the community is and uh, who's working on what and uh, the kind of the ecosystem around it and the little changes we're making on the Swift client, I want to uh, go a little bit into a new process that we have uh, called Specs and what that is meaning for uh, how that's been framing the conversations uh, that we've been working on. So Specs are uh, basically a collaborative design process for bigger features within Swift. There are several uh, parts of the, several different projects inside of OpenStack that have adopted uh, some sort of specs process. And it's, it's something that is kind of caught on like wildfire, but uh, I think it's very early in figuring out how, do this, how does this process actually work. And so it's good to think that this is, this is an experiment. The goal here is to increase communication. The goal is not to have another process to do something. So this is, gonna, this is kind of our second try at making a specs process for Swift that is effective and works. And so our current thing that we're talking about uh, that we're using inside of this integrated release cycle is to, when, when a spec is proposed, we want to iterate and land on those, uh, land those specs very quickly. We're not going to look for this big design document up front that has every possible contingency and, and use case and uh, corner case defined and, and, uh, and explored out. What we want to do is we want to uh, have it as a way to improve communication, especially when people are working across different companies, across different time zones, and things like that. So we want to be able to um, 
we want to land things fast as soon as we can agree on something. And we want to keep those updated as we iterate on our conversations and figure out what the best way going forward is. And as the coding happens, so once we agree on this is a thing that we think we should do, then um, when coding starts, we want to keep the spec updated based on our um, keep the spec updated based on what the implementation actually does. So another point of this is that specs are not docs. Docs are different. They have a different audience. Specs are designed for the communication. So that being said, what are some of the things that we're talking about? Next slide. What are actually, uh, what's actually going on inside of the community? What's being worked on? What's our, what are these conversations, these collaborative conversations that were actually happening? Well, one of the first ones is a big one that we've been talking about quite a bit, erasure codes. We have a major feature that landed uh, in, uh, several months ago inside of Swift called Storage Policies. Storage Policies allow you to configure how that is stored inside of your, uh, inside of your cluster at a very uh, fine granular level. One of the things that we can build on top of that is to be able to actually uh, configure how your data is stored across the set of hardware. So today we use replication, and then we're building the feature uh, to allow you to do erasure codes on top of uh, inside of your Swift cluster alongside of replication. So the data that needs to be stored that way can be. So what's the status? This uh, this is a little screenshot of the status our, our current Trello board status uh, as of last night. Um, Basically, the progress is good. We are working very hard, and lots of people, lots of different companies are constantly talking about this. Um, we are uh, getting something that's going to be demoable very, very soon. And uh, a lot of the work that's uh, been done up to this point has been spent on some very hard design problems and making sure that we have these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, fundamental problems uh, figured out before we start doing some of the more uh, demoable things like, oh, well, let's just read and write the data up front. So one of the hard problems that we're figuring out that we're planning on being able to support as of this point is the ability to overwrite uh, objects that have been stored uh, as erasure-coded uh, data. This uh, doesn't sound like a very hard problem, but when you think about the fact that the different components uh, that make up the erasure-coded object uh, are in fact stored across a lot of different pieces of different physical hardware, the coordination problem becomes rather tricky uh, when figuring out, well, what is the actual uh, instance or version of the object that you are actually trying to keep and maintain and, and know that that's going to be your durable copy. So that's a hard problem that we're trying to figure out. And it's complicated by the fact that uh, Swift does not have the concept of a global lock. So you can't lock the cluster down or even lock a particular object down and, um, and say, okay, well now we're going to have something that's going to be a, basically an atomic operation or even just a, a, an operation inside of a transaction that's, that you can roll back. That doesn't actually work inside of Swift as, as a distributed system. So um, we've got to figure out how do we make, make progress on this and allow the uh, erasure coded objects to have the same semantics as replicated objects uh, from a client perspective. So we're working really hard on this. And these are some very tricky problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and it's going to be done when it's done. This is our top priority inside of our current integrated release cycle. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty uh, confident that we're going to have something uh, that's pretty cool pretty soon. Next slide. One of the other big things uh, that we have seen inside of the communities, one of the other conversations, um, especially coming from some of those big customers, you know, talking about some more of these enterprise features, is the concept of encryption. And encryption is, especially when you're talking about storage, has it's a very loaded word that has a as soon as you say it, a lot of people assume they know exactly what you're talking about. The problem is there's a lot of different use cases that can be wrapped up in this concept of encryption. So uh, what we're talking about right now and what uh, we're hearing from users and looking at um, the thing that people need to solve first is solving the problem of basically if a hard drive walks out of my, my cluster, um, either maliciously or inadvertently, I need to make sure that nobody can read the data that is stored on it. 
So there's a lot of different ways to do this. And uh, right now we've got uh, some very interested users and customers for this, uh, some active conversations including a, a very active spec document uh, being worked on right now as far as here's how we can have a framework uh, by which we can implement uh, encryption, uh, which means uh, encryption at rest, the data at rest um, for data stored inside of Swift, and something that will work for different use cases um, that will uh, not uh, be too complicated, but also not be too limiting uh, for people who need to do this. So it's something that uh, is, again, an active conversation inside the community. Uh, next up. Next up is this thing uh, called composite tokens. It has, it's an auth, um, it's new functionality to work with auth systems. Basically the idea uh, in here is uh, that we have some data inside of Swift that may be put there by a, a service. So in this sense, especially looking at a, a broader OpenStack deployment, you could imagine that somebody has, is using OpenStack Compute and then using OpenStack uh, Image Service to store these images inside of Swift. So uh, you don't necessarily, though, want to have uh, the end user be able to delete those images without going through some other process because that could uh, make some things inconsistent with, with the whole index and, and everything like that. So you still need to be able to track it and you need to have appropriate permissions on it. But um, and, and then on the other hand, you don't necessarily want the system itself to uh, make a, a decisions on the behalf of the user. Um, so the, the, the proposal here is to require for uh, certain uh, levels of permission that the operation requires two auth tokens, one from the service and one from the end user. So this is called composite tokens. And uh, it's something that has been uh, worked on inside of Keystone, and there's very active discussions happening inside of Swift, although there's not any code in Swift uh, for that right now. So next up. Next up is something that we call fast post. Post is an HTTP verb, and inside of Swift it's used to uh, modify metadata uh, for objects. And in almost all cases uh, right now, it is inside of Swift, it's implemented as a copy. So you send a little bit of metadata, and the system will read the old data and then write out the new data with your new piece of metadata. So that works pretty well, especially since in most use cases, posts aren't, you, aren't done very frequently. Unfortunately, it makes it a rather expensive operation. So, Fast post is um, something that uh, is, is an improvement on that so that we do not have to do that, uh, that server-side copy. Uh, this is something that uh, there's a lot of historical reasons for why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, it's something that there are some active uh, patches and reviews going in right now to um, see if we can get rid of that server-side copy so that we can make post operations very, very fast. And that's uh, something that's, again, just uh, along the lines of continued efficiency improvements that we always like to look at for Swift. Which brings me actually to kind of the general catch-all uh, next topic here, which is we're working on efficiency improvements inside of Swift. This is something we always want to uh, keep our eye on, uh, especially as people are storing more and more data and having more and more users on this. Uh, if you remember, Swift is, is designed for massive scale, massive concurrency across uh, the entire data set. So we have to make sure that we're, the things that we're doing, uh, we're not doing too much and we're not uh, doing them too slowly. So uh, there's a few things that kind of go under this right now in addition to the fast post feature. Uh, some of the stuff that we're talking about that some people are uh, playing with and again, some conversations that are happening right now uh, involve uh, making uh, very, very large containers more efficient. Uh, there's some improvements that I'm pretty excited about that are along the lines of improving efficiency in global replication. So if you have regions that are uh, separated by a continent or separated by an ocean, making that a little bit more efficient. Um, and then overall, we're of course just continuing to uh, fix bugs, make, make it easier for end users and operators. Um, this even comes back to the current project that our 
uh, outreach, GNOME Outreach Program in turn is working on uh, making sure that we've got some operator tools that really allow you just to validate your cluster very simply. Um, so it's something we always want to keep our mind on, and again, there's lots of conversations with that. So would you like to get involved? That is, if you would like to get involved, you're more than welcome. We would love to have you help out um, and, and come on in. Uh, you can get involved. Uh, the best way is uh, hang out in the OpenStack-Swift IRC channel on the Freenode IRC network. Uh, there's a lot of people there in a lot of different time zones. So generally, any time of the day or night, you should be able to find uh, answers to your questions and figure out how to get involved. Uh, we even have a wiki page uh, that has just some lightweight ideas of, hey, here's something that we don't even really have any detail around it, but somebody's mentioned it more than once, and it would just be kind of a cool thing to work on. So this is even a kind of a good place if, if you'd like to uh, play around with some things and you don't have your own idea of what to work on already, this is a good place to a good list to start with. And then if you'd like to uh, begin coding and, and uh, get involved with actually uh, making the code itself better, fixing bugs, adding features, things like that. Uh, the best way to uh, get installed uh, with a, uh, a dev environment is using the link provided here. Uh, it's a Swift all-in-one environment that can be very simply provisioned uh, with VirtualBox and Vagrant. So we would love to have you come along. We have weekly meetings. Uh, those you can find in IRC. Uh, also, you feel free to contact me, uh, Twitter, email, IRC. Uh, and I try to respond to as much of that as I can. Um, and that's what we have. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. And Allison, thank you for having me today.